I thank you, saints, for being so easy to talk to, to share with, to open my heart. And so I'm going to ask you again tonight to be just like you were last night, just like little birdies, little eagle birdies, with your mouths wide open, saying to the mother eagle, put it in, my mouth is open. <laughs> you know, this afternoon as I was messing around, the Lord dropped this word into my heart. And at first I didn't know where it might fit. I heard him say, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. And I pondered that. wonder why he was saying this. And then I realized it had to do with what I want to share tonight. And what I want to share tonight is something that is written of us, you and I, in the book. It's not just written of Jesus, it's written of us. In the volume of the book, it is written of us. And isn't it exciting to know that even in the Old Testament there are things that are written of us, for us, about us, and we never knew it. We never saw it. So I have a big treat in store for you. As I was praying what to share at the camp, the Lord spoke to my heart. I want them to know about Benjamin. I want them to know about Benjamin. So we're going to read what is our portion in the volume of the book that's about Benjamin, because Benjamin is a type and shadow of that remnant company of which I spoke last night. And um, there's much to it, and I just hope the Lord will give me the liberty to act this out before you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Perhaps three years ago, I was at a camp meeting down in North Carolina. And uh, you know how you have sweet fellowship with people? And I was having fellowship with a, a dear lady. And she said, you know, the last while, the Lord has been speaking to me about Benjamin. He speaks this over and over. And I'm not too sure what it means, but I, I have an idea. I said, what is it? What is it? And this is what the Lord said to her. Benjamin is coming. There will be no more food until Benjamin is released by the Father. But man, that's heavy duty. I wonder exactly what he's saying by that. Benjamin is coming. The remnant is coming. But what's this about the food? There will be no more food until Benjamin is released by the Father. Now we'll just throw that out. I'm not going to make any comment on it, but later on we'll come to that again and we'll have more understanding about it. So I'm going to go into a little bit of background about um, Benjamin, who is a type of the sonship for the remnant company. I'll go into a little history here. Benjamin's daddy was Jacob. We know that. And um, Jacob, you know, was born in the Promised Land. That's where he was born. And then he went down back to Mesopotamia. That's the land that Abraham was called to leave. It's called Babylon, right near Babylon. Abraham, the man of faith, was called to leave there. And Jacob had to go down there. And um, he was fleeing, but he also was going to be rewarded with the bride. So he fled from Esau, from his flesh. He went to Babylon. And when he was there, he um, fell in love with this beautiful girl called Rachel. But she had a sister, Leah. The Bible says she was weak-eyed, whatever that means. And she wasn't as fair and beautiful as her sister, Rachel. And so he loved Rachel. And he worked seven years for her. Remember that? And then there was the big wedding, and he was so thrilled at last he would hold this darling to his bosom and never part from the one he loved. She was so beautiful. But remember how Jacob tripped him? And he took her that night, and he thought he had Rachel. And in the morning light he found out, Oh, I have embraced Leah. I have taken Leah unto myself. 
How could you do this to me? And he went to Jacob, feeling this anger and this storm in his heart. I've been tricked. I've been cheated. Of course, um, he'd been doing a little tricking and cheating himself. So, you know, what goes around comes around, let's face it. But he was pretty angry. So he went to his father-in-law and he said, Why have you done this? He said, It is the law that the firstborn, the eldest, must be married before the younger. But if you really love the younger, well, we can arrange for that too. If you want to work another seven years, you may have her. Ah, well, he didn't have too much choice. And I always thought he had to wait another seven years to have her as his bride. But no, he was able to take her as his bride simultaneously with Leah. And um, he worked another seven years, but he had his two wives. Now, Leah, I'm going to get into types and shadows here. And if you can't follow me, just um, rest a bit. You'll understand your portion is for you. I've asked the Lord to give each of you a portion. And don't worry if you can't take it all, because there's going to be some big hunks of meat here. I did not put it through the meat grinder. You're not getting any hamburger. You're getting pure steak. Here we go. <laughs> you like steak? Great. That's the only kind of stuff I serve. You want pablum, you go somewhere else. I don't have any. All right. So here is Leah and Rachel. Leah speaks of the law. So he was wed or um, he embraced the law first. And then if Leah speaks of the law, what does Rachel speak of? Rachel speaks of the gospel dispensation, the 2,000 years of the church age that we have walked. Rachel speaks of that. And of course, uh, that's the spiritual age. You know, the spirit has been moving. There's been the life of God. And the law doesn't look very attractive in comparison to that, does it? And so uh, Leah's eyes were weak. She couldn't see the things that Rachel saw. Her eyes were dim and weak. She couldn't see the things of the Spirit. All she could see was the letter of the law. And so we first embrace that concept. When we're first saved, what do we embrace? But the law. And we're married to the law for quite some time. But at the same time, we are also in the gospel dispensation. Man, what a mess. And uh, we've all been there. We've all first embraced the law. And Gary was talking this morning of, of works and performance and all this stuff, trying to uh, warrant our, or to earn our salvation. When we came to the Lord, we asked him into our hearts by faith. And then they proceed to tell us, now you have to do this and that and that and that and that to keep your salvation, to keep in good standing with the Lord. So what would you call that? He thought, we thought we had Rachel. But in fact, we had embraced Leah, hadn't we? The law. We had embraced the law. And you know what the law brought forth? The law brought forth ten sons. How many commandments are there? Ten commandments. And these ten sons came forth from Leah and from the servant girls. And so the servant girls are called bond women. So all the fruit of the law came from Leah and the bond women, and it genders to what? Bondage. Oh, yes, it genders to bondage. And all this time that the handmaids, the bondmaids and, and Leah are being very prolific and producing all these sons, poor Rachel, the beloved of Jacob, is barren. And she's so embarrassed and so humiliated and feeling so left out. And one day, she couldn't handle it anymore. And she just cried unto Jacob and pled with him, I must have sons. Give me sons or I die. He said, Woman, he said, do you think I can be God to you? Why do you talk like that to me? He felt as desperate as she did. He wanted to bring forth by spirit, from spiritual principles. He wanted to bring forth after grace, but that part of him was barren and unfruitful. He couldn't bring anything forth from grace or, or from spiritual principles because it seems the law had taken preeminence. Are you relating to this at all? Are you, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, good, good. 
All right, this is just a little background. And so Rachel is the gospel age. She's also spiritual principles. And when she felt so badly about being barren for so long, this is what she said. She said that she suffered. It says of her that she suffered reproach because she was barren. Do you know what that means? It means that she suffered reproach because she could not reproduce his image within her. Do you hear it? Do you hear it? And we have been barren for a long time, following after the law, desiring to reproduce the image of Christ in us. And we didn't see anything coming forth. We were barren. We could not reproduce his image. But you know, the day came that God remembered Rachel and God hearkened to her and she conceived and bare a son and she said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. Joseph means adding, adding. Uh, so she had this son, and she named him Adding. He's going to add to me another son. I wonder who that's going to be. <laughs> oh, glory to God. And so Joseph is always, in the scriptures, a beautiful type of Jesus. Okay. And when Jesus came, or Joseph, we'll put them together, there were no more sons born through the law or the servants. That was all over. After Jesus gave himself in sacrifice on the cross for us, the ceremonial law ceased. And what did he do? By dying for us, he takes away our reproach and gives us power to reproduce, to produce his image in us. Oh, glory to God. That's what Jesus does. That's what Joseph did. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He took away the reproach of this whole dispensation, giving us power to produce his image in us. And so after Joseph came, the law and the bond women were finished bearing. Just were finished bearing. <laughs> because Joseph had come. And then another son was on the way. Benjamin. And while Rachel was pregnant with Benjamin, Jacob felt it was time to leave Mesopotamia there, the land of his in-laws and so on. He said, I just want to take you back to where I live. I want to take you back to the promised land with me. I'm going to go. And he, when he left the land, he came to Mesopotamia to take back a bride and flock. And therein hangs a tale there. And you know, when we have been in Babylon for a while, we also want to take back the bride and flocks back to where we came from, back to that realm of spirit where we are at home and we're comfortable. So Benjamin, Rachel was pregnant with Benjamin when Jacob decided, I'm going to pack up my family, I'm going back to where I was born, to the land I was born in, to that land of spirit, that land of spirit called the promised land. I'm going back there. And so they journeyed. I don't know how long, how many days, weeks, months. And they came just a little way from Bethlehem, a little way from Ephrata, it said. And Rachel travailed, and she was in very heavy travail. And it looked like they could lose her, and perhaps even lose the baby. And the midwife said, no, no, we, she shall have this child also. And she did. She had Benjamin, but she died in the birthing. And therein is a tremendous lesson, a tremendous picture of us. Because here we have Rachel that speaks of the gospel dispensation returning to the promised land 
And the promised land is signified here. She was going to Bethlehem. She died just a short distance from Bethlehem. And the meaning of Bethlehem is the house of bread or fruitfulness. And so this age of the church age is going to die and pass away just short of fruitfulness. It's not quite going to get to the house of bread before it brings forth Benjamin. And when she brought forth Benjamin in her sore travail as she was dying, she said, Oh, Benoni, Benoni. She named him Benoni, which is the son of my sorrow. And if you'll notice, the wives there, Leah and Rachel, they named all the children. The father, Jacob, didn't name them. I guess whatever the wives decided their names would be, that was fine with them. But this time, Jacob intervened, and he said, He shall not be called Benoni. He shall not be called the son of my sorrow. His name shall be Benjamin, the son of the right hand. Hallelujah. The son of the right hand shall not be the son of my sorrow. But I want you to know, my brethren, my sisters, as far as the church is concerned, in every generation, those who have been a part of this remnant company, and our generation is no exception, the church that is part law and part grace, yet a mixture of that, they consider us the sons of their sorrow. Why can't they fit in with us? Why can't they be one with us? Why do they have to be so different? Why do they always have to be so discontented? Why can't they be satisfied with all these forms and rituals and the traditions of our fathers? Why can't they be satisfied with this? Why do they have to want Jesus with all their hearts? Yes, we are the son of the church's sorrow. <laughs> I know when I left the church system and I didn't want to leave, but I prophesied in church one day, and that um, in a Pentecostal church, and they asked me to either um, shut up or leave, take your pick. I thought, oh, this really is no place for me. I'm gone. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> and it wasn't that I wanted to, but they were not ready for any manifestation of the Spirit. And so... Uh, Leah was still alive and well and ruling there. And I had embraced Rachel. Man, I couldn't go back to Leah at all. I just couldn't stand those weak eyes. They didn't have any vision. They didn't see what God was doing. <laughs> and Rachel is so beautiful. I had embraced her and I couldn't let her go. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so Rachel travailed and brought forth this son, the son of my right hand, a little short of the house of bread, a little short of the fullness, a little short of fruitfulness. And people are grieved and they look at, well, we've had the Holy Spirit for these 2,000 years and we've had churches on every corner. Why is it that there are so few? Why is it that the world has become so wicked and we don't have that much uh, power to influence it? Why is it? Because Rachel is dying, and she didn't yet make it to fruitfulness. She didn't make it to the house of bread. But it's all right, because what she brought forth, the son of my right hand, that remnant, is going to make it. Yes, he is. Yes, we are. In the volume of the book, it's written of us. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, I'll go back a little bit, just a few steps. Where did Rachel leave from? Like Rachel and Jacob and all that family, where were they living when they left to go back to the Promised Land? They were living at Bethel when they set out on this journey. So they were going to leave Bethel behind, and Bethel is the house of God. Oh, don't get blasphemous here. That's not very nice to say, Elaine. You're going to leave the house of God? Well, actually, I could put it perhaps this way. They were going to leave the old system of thinking, the old mindset, the old traditions of man, and they were going to 
go with Jesus. They were going to go with spiritual principles, brother. Right? Amen. Glory to God. So they were going to leave the house of God and to leave the old system of thinking, leaving it behind on the way to the promised land. And so they got a little short of Bethlehem. And Benjamin was born on the way to fruitfulness. Oh, glory to God. Are you still with me? Is it still okay? Is it sinking down? Are you saying amen? Yeah. All right. All right. And so this second son is from the same source of life as the first one. Hmm. The same source of life. Glory to God. And so Jacob, his father, and Rachel is spiritual principles, a new way of thinking. And this son, this remnant, was given a new name by the father. A new name. Now, there's only a specific group given a new name in the scripture. It didn't say this new name was for everybody. In Revelation 3.12, it talks about that new name. I just want to peek at it just quickly because it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> to him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Where is this temple? Do I have to go anywhere to go to it? Here's the temple. To him that overcometh will I make a pillar. Steadfast, strong, sure, tried, tested. Amen. Glory to God. And he shall go no more out. Out of where? Out of what? Shall go no more out of the realm of the Spirit. We go in the ways that the realm of the Spirit for a while, come back out, in and out. Oh, we get sick of it. The Lord said, come in and go no more out. He's preparing the people to walk in the Spirit and not come out of it. It's going to be their their constant habitation, their dwelling place. Amen. They live there. And they're not moving tomorrow or the next day. They're going to abide there. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So these are the overcomers. They're going to be a pillar. They're going to be steadfast. And he shall go no more out. And what else? And I'll write upon him the name of my God. What is the name of my God? His nature. With the holy finger of God, with the moving of my spirit, and through the trials and testings, I'm writing upon you my nature. Glory to God. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, that which is coming down from above upon us, that birth of the spirit from above, the New Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. I think it's new because we've never known it before, have we? All we've known is old Mr. Adam and his ways, but this new man, this new name, we have not known. But we're beginning to have a foretaste of it, aren't we? We're beginning to taste that new name. And so who is given a new name? Overcomers. And in every generation, the son of my sorrow, as the church has called us, that have been excommunicated, they have been tortured, they have been slain, they have been burned at the stake, their names have been cast out as evil. You name it, it's happened to them. But in God's sight, they have never been the son of my sorrow, because the father, Jacob, said, it shall not be. They're the sons of my right hand, and the right hand is the authority of God. It's the authority of the throne. This remnant company shall have the authority of the throne because they have been willing to let the spiritual principles of God rule in their life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. That's where I shout. Hallelujah. Romati Kurisanama. Inno Karoma Devantai. Son of thy right hand, O God. Son of thy right hand. Hallelujah. Yes, brother. Son of the right hand. <laughs> oh. And sometimes we thought we we thought ourselves that we were sons of sorrow to ourselves. We thought, man, I missed it by a country mile and never make it. We acted like we were Benoni instead of Benjamin, didn't we? But you're not Benoni. No, you are not. 
You are Benjamin. You are the son of my right hand. All glory to God. <laughs> oh, hallelujah! <laughs> Now, the plot thickens. We are going to、uh, scene two. Scene two is in the palace, and we're going to、uh, put a little background there. I'm sure you all know the story, but I like telling stories. <laughs> and so, we find that Jacob's family. Is in the promised land, and they're growing. The sons have grown up, and and Benjamin is a is a young man. I understand he's round about 17 or something like that when this story happens. And we all know the story of Joseph, what the brothers did to him, that he had dreams of ruling, and his father and his mother and his brothers bowed to him. Do you have any dreams of ruling and reigning? And if you do, I think your brethren would like to put you in the pit, wouldn't they? Yeah, they would like to, and perhaps verbally they put you in the pit, because you have dreams of ruling and reigning. Who do you think you are? Okay. <laughs> so we know what the brothers did to Joseph, and Joseph went through much. He went through、uh, very strong temptations and testings, imprisonments, and everything, and cruel and. Unjust treatment by his brothers, and yet he learned a mighty thing. He learned to remit sins, didn't he? He learned to forgive, and he didn't wait till his brothers came and apologized to him before he forgave them. Mm -mm -mm. He must have forgiven them long before he saw them, or he couldn't have done it. Every time he was put in a place of bondage, like in the prison or wherever, or in Potiphar's house. Hey, he was the ruler of it. <laughs> he ruled in every place, although it looked dreadful. He's in prison, but he's ruling over that situation. Yes, he is. It didn't get him down.、Like, this looks pretty bad, but Lord, you put me here, so I'm going to just do the very best I can. Glory to God. So there we are. He wants us to rule in every situation, no matter how mean our brethren get to us. Just rule over it. Remit their sin. Hallelujah. And so we find that Joseph learned obedience. How? Through the same thing that it says of Jesus, and that it says of us. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Oh, glory to God! Through the things that he suffered. Don't despise the cross, my brethren, because it teaches you obedience. It does a work in your heart, and you know the Lord. Intended all the time that Joseph should rule over Egypt, but he couldn't trust him to rule in his fleshly, carnal mind. So he set up the whole stage that he would be brought down. He was brought through suffering unto glory. And what are we looking for at the Feast of Tabernacles? We're looking for glory. We're looking for His image and likeness to be reproduced in us. So don't cry too hard or think it's a strange thing if you suffer along the way. It's part of the course. It's part of the route to、uh, the throne, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And you know, God meant it to him for good. Yes, He did. He meant it to Joseph for good. And sometimes we forget that when rough things come. We think, Oh Lord, have I sinned? Or are you mad at me? Or you know, all this rejection stuff. Well, hey, if something's coming that's just not too good, the Lord is. Often testing our attitudes and proving us how we will react or respond to the things that He sends. Will we re respond in love, in forgiveness, in remitting sins? If not, if you can't, then let's face it: there'll be another go round there and another go round until you learn. Oh, I guess I better look at my own heart here. <laughs> Stop blaming that other guy. He did it to me, or she did it to me. You know, and see what God is doing. And so, God meant it for good to Joseph, and not only for good.、Uh, Joseph said he did this that he would use me to save many alive when there's famine in the land. You know, my brethren, he's going to use us to save many alive when there's famine in the land, and there is famine for the hearing of the word of the Lord. There's famine for hearing. The word of the Lord, something that has substance, something that has 
something you can get a hold of that will cause you to be fruitful and multiply, that will take you to the house of bread. <laughs> Glory to God. And so the famine is close to coming upon the land, and we know how it was that Joseph was called from prison to interpret this dream. I won't go into all of that. But Joseph had the wisdom from God to tell Pharaoh what to do and what was going to happen. He said, you really should appoint a wise man, Joseph said, to look over this. And Pharaoh said, hey, where could I find a wiser man than you in whom the Spirit of God is? Will you do it? I appoint you to do it. So he was second unto Pharaoh. Pharaoh gave him his ring of authority. And uh, no man came in or, or went out without Joseph's permission. And Joseph had the wisdom of God. He knew what to do. And so he caused the, the corn to be stored up. Have you been storing up some corn? I want to tell you, I've been storing up for so many years. My storehouses are full to bursting. I can hardly handle it sometime. Full corn full of corn. I've talked to some of you here and they, you said the same thing. Man, I'm so full and I have no place to pour out upon. It's okay. Hang in there, saints, because there's a famine in the land. It's going to get worse and it's going to come for your corn. They're going to say, oh, Dave, have you got any corn? Have you got any corn? And he said, yes, I bought this at great price, but I'll give it to you for nothing. <laughs> come. Come and get it. It's yours. I paid for it, but you can have it. I gave it unto you freely. They're going to come to us and they'll say, How come you're at peace? How come your countenance is shining with joy and gladness? I want that. I want that corn and that wine and that oil that I see upon you. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory to God. And so... Uh, Joseph stored up for the years of famine. And the famine was sore upon all the lands around, not just Egypt, but all the lands around, even the promised land in Goshen, where Jacob and his family were, even that land, their crops were burned up and they had very little food. And finally the day came when Jacob called the sons together and he said, I hear that there's corn in Egypt. And so they came down to Egypt. Do you remember the story? They came down to Egypt and they presented themselves to buy grain. And um, Joseph recognized them. But they did not recognize them. After all, he's in these royal robes. And he's number one man in the country and dressed in beautiful attire and with all this authority in Egypt. They would never dream that could be that little kid they threw in the pit and sold to the Ishmaelites. Never put that together at all. So he knew them, but they didn't know him. So he didn't just go and, uh, uh, there's something with this forgiveness and remitting sins. Sometimes the Lord does a little judgment here first, a little testing of the heart to cause the heart to turn. And so Joseph accused him of being spies. You just came to spy out the nakedness of the land. That's what you did. That's what you came for. Oh, no, 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 we didn't do that. Oh, yes, yes, you are spies. He even put them, threw them in jail for three days. Cool their heels a bit and cause them to think about what they did to him when he was a, a young lad. After three days, he called them back out. And then he asked him, he said, is your father yet alive? He said, oh, yes, our father is alive. And do you have another brother? He said, yes, we have a younger brother who is living with our father. And then we have a brother who is not. And that meant Joseph. <laughs> They're talking to him. He said, he is not like a, he died or he's out of the picture. We have a brother who is not. And we have our younger brother who's with our father. And he said, and is the old man well? He said, yes, our father is well. Thank you. He said, fine, I'll let you have the corn. But he said, when you come back, I want you to bring your younger brother. Oh, oh, Reuben said, oh, I'm so sorry. We can't do that. We can't bring him because it would break our father's heart if anything happened to him. We just couldn't do that because, you see, our other brother is gone and this, this son 
is so close to his heart. The heart of the father is wrapped up in this lad. The heart of the father is wrapped up in Benjamin. I can't bring him down to you. And I have a friend who asked the Lord. In fact, this is the word he said. His life, like the father's life, his life is bound up in the lad's life. I can't bring him. And I have a friend back home whose name is Faith, and she's a special a friend of mine. And she said, Elaine, one time I was asking the Lord, why, why did you call this Benjamin remnant and not the whole church? Why did you do that? It almost seems a little prejudicial or something like that, or favoritism. I don't like that. Why did you do that? Why did you call the Benjamin Company to come forth first? Why, instead of the whole church. And you know what he told her? He said, I have set my love upon him. I have set my love upon him. And that reminds me of what they said of Jacob. His life is bound up in the lad's life. So this remnant, not to say that God prefers us above others, but we are that remnant in whom he is first in working his nature. And so it is so special to him. It's like he's got this pregnant bride, you know? And they're so beautiful here to him, and he's waiting for that a child to be born that looks just like him. So that's really more special than someone who just has the seed of life and isn't yet learning obedience or anything like that. But their turn is coming. I'm not leaving them out. It's just that the Benjamin Company is first being prepared, and they will come later. Is that okay? And so he told the brethren here, he said, you will not see my face unless your brother is with you. And so... They were so upset about this. They didn't know what to do. And they kept saying, oh, we can't. Our father would never let him go. Finally, Joseph got very stern. And he said, I will keep one of you here until you come back with your brother. And of all the ten sons that were there, whom did he choose to put in prison? It's very interesting. He chose Simeon. And Simeon means hearing. He imprisoned the hearing. He imprisoned their hearing so they could not hear. This is what has happened to the brethren in the law. They can't hear what the Spirit is saying. And they won't be able to hear or know until Benjamin comes to where Joseph is. That he has to come to where I am to where Joseph, to where Jesus is walking. This realm of spirit, Benjamin must come here. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That remnant must come to where uh, the realm of spirit in which I walk. And until he comes, the hearing of the church is bound, is in prison. Are you hearing this, my darlings? Are you hearing it? Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it beautiful? Oh, wow. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Glory to God. And Simeon's going to be in prison until Joseph comes to where Jesus is. And then the church will be set free. They'll be able to hear. Because we won't just be telling them truth or teaching them doctrines. We'll be living it. Walking it out, eh? Right. The Spirit of the Lord shall be alive and well in us, and we will have brought forth and reproduced His image in us. Hallelujah. We won't be barren and unfruitful. We've gone to the house of bread. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, Father, write this upon their hearts right now, Lord, and that it shall go deep into their spirits, that they won't forget it. It won't just be words that are floating over their head, Father. Write it in their hearts. Cause them to know and understand this portion of what I'm sharing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, Father, our hearing has been bound, but you have loosed it. Oh, Father, you loosed our hearing and you called us to be a Benjamite, to be of that remnant. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. 
glory to God. Roma di di asul kamaharan tundaya. Hila holoku tiriyama hosala karanda. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, Father. Oh, Father. <laughs> oh, Father. Hallelujah. And so the sons went home. And on the way, they opened their sacks. Or maybe they waited until they got home. I'm not too sure when they got home. Uh, they opened their sacks. They found all the money that they had given for the rain was in the mouth of their sacks. So, oh, we are in trouble. He thought we were spies already. Now he'll think we're thieves we, as if we stole that money and didn't pay for the grain. And they said to the father, I don't think we can ever go back there. I hope this famine lifts so that we don't ever have to do that. But in the process of time, the supplies of grain got lower and lower and lower. And Jacob said, my sons, you have to go back. You have to go back to Egypt and get more grain. The children will starve. Your wives will starve if we don't have food. You have to go back. They said, oh, we cannot go back unless you send Benjamin with us. And again, he said, oh, he said, uh, my, my hairs would go down to the grave if I should send Benjamin. Don't you know my life is bound up in his blood? I can't let him go. But eventually, he had to let him go. And Reuben the eldest, or was it Judah? Well, anyway, one of them. <laughs> um, they made a covenant with their father. They said, let my sons and my own life be a surety for the life of Benjamin. If we do not bring him back safely, my life and the life of my own sons are yours. And you know, this was a different kind of heart because they didn't have any heart for Joseph when they were throwing him away. But now they're going surety for their brother. They're starting to be a melting there. They're starting to give of themselves, you know? And so reluctantly, Jacob finally consented for Benjamin to go along. And when they got back to Egypt and they went to the man in charge of the grain, and first thing they did was they said, they started talking really fast and they said, you know, we're, we're, we're really not thieves. We really, really didn't take that money, you know. The money was put somehow in, in the mouth of our bag. So we got home, we found it there, but, but we did give it to you. And the man said, um, oh, that's okay. I, I received it. I, I got it. And I put it back again, too. It's all right. We, we're not going to throw you in jail for that. And so as soon as Joseph heard that they were there. He sent word down to his servant to tell them that they were invited to come and eat with him at noon. Now, the first time they were invited to eat with him, and noon, my brethren, is the highest place of light. I'm going to show you my glory here. <laughs> come and eat with me in this highest place of light. And they couldn't have ever come to that place if Benjamin hadn't been with them. Because Benjamin was there, but Jesus said, you can come to this smell of spirit. <laughs> yes, you can. And so when they came to have dinner with him, they came in and here's the Egyptians eating at one table because their law forbade them to eat with the Hebrews. And here's Joseph sitting by himself at his table. And then there's a table for the brothers by themselves. It was all arranged. I guess they must have name tags or whatever. It was all arranged from the eldest to the youngest in order. And they looked. Mm, who would know this? Who would know who's the elder and who's the middle and who's the younger? They start feeling a little bit scared. It's called the fear of the Lord came upon them. Yes, the fear of the Lord came upon them. And so Joseph came in and he kept his stiff upper lip at first and he asked them, he said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke? And he said, yes, it is. And he looked upon him. And he revealed himself. He said, I am Joseph, your brother. 
I am Joseph, your brother, whom you threw into the pit. I am Joseph, your brother. And they were like those men that must have been at the tomb, or those angels that fell back when the glory of God came and Jesus rose in resurrection. They fell back. I'm sure the brethren of Joseph must have fallen back. How could this be? We thought Joseph was either dead by now or certainly in bondage in Egypt. How could he be this royal man, this man of great authority over all the treasures of Egypt? How could this be? And so they were fearful. And he took Benjamin and he fell upon his neck. And Benjamin fell upon his neck. So here they were holding each other, one neck upon there, the other neck upon him. And the neck, my brethren, speaks of the will. And so Jesus put his will upon us. We put our will upon him. Our wills were one. We had that embrace of our will becoming one. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And then he proceeded to forgive his brethren. He said, it was not you that did it unto me. It was God. It was God that did it unto me. And he did it unto me for good. To save many alive at this day. He meant it unto me for good. And he knew, he caused them to know that they were forgiven. But that meal was quite interesting. Because when they brought all the portions... They came to Benjamin, and they brought him five messes of food. Now, this word mess is rather interesting. And I was down in North Carolina. No, this was Arkansas. This brother, his wife would say, would you go and pick me a mess of beans, or maybe a mess of potatoes, or whatever. Finally, I said, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm from Canada. And up there, when we talk about a mess, well, that's a mess. It's some mess. It's all over. It's a mess. What is this mess of beans and mess of potatoes that you're talking about? Oh, they said, it means a large quantity of something, like something that is a good measure, an abundance, not just a few beans or a few potatoes. A mess of beans is a good quantity. And so Joseph gave Benjamin five messes, five large quantities. Well, man, he's just a kid. He's only 17. How could he How could he eat that much? Well, if the Lord wants to see something there, five is the number of grace. He gave him five times as much grace as his brethren had. Do you like it? Do you like it? <laughs> Hallelujah. And you know, I've been seeing that five times measure of grace being passed around at this camp. Yesterday we ate five messes of grace all day long, and today I think we've had about ten. Haven't we? <laughs> oh, glory to God. Glory to God. And you know, this grace doesn't come naturally to us because it has to be worked in us by the spirit by suffering by being brought low uh, in the eyes of our brethren all that sort of thing I talked to someone yesterday about remitting sins and they said oh I, I guess I believe in that but I think that you know if someone needed to have their sins remitted if they wronged me I, I would do it if they came and uh, apologize to me, I'd surely remit their sins. Aha, uh -huh. I thought to myself, yes, this is what the law says. <laughs> if they will make it right, yes, I'll forgive you. But you know what this five messes of grace says? Don't wait for them to humble themselves and come to you and apologize. You remit their sins right now, even while they're still angry at you and casting um, the darts at you, casting your name out as evil. Remit their sins right now. You've got plenty of it. You've got five measures. Five measures, much more than any of the other brethren have that are under the law. 
This one's under the law. He doesn't have enough grace to do that. But if you can do that, you'll set him free so that God can work that grace in him. But if you don't remit his sins, then he's still in bondage to that offense. And um, he'll not be able to rise above it or let the Lord in to do that work until you release him from your bad feelings or your resentments or things like that. So I know this Benjamin company when I meet them because I'll tell you what the Lord is doing. I see them all partaking of five measures of grace. I see it. I see it working. Maybe they're just on their first measure, but boy, they know, hey, this is different. I've never experienced anything like this before. It's, it's unusual, but I like it. Isn't that wonderful? So, in this lunch where they're having at noonday in the brightest sun, Joseph allows them to see his brother eating this abundance partaking of this abundance of grace. <laughs> the brethren don't have it yet, but, whoa, they're looking at him. He's got something different from what we have. Glory to God. Now, after they had their lunch and so on, they had to pack up their sacks and go on their way back to Goshen to take the food home. And Joseph told his man in charge, he said, put their money back. Not only the money they brought back, but, but the money they brought this time, double money, put, the, put it back in their sacks. And in the sack of the younger one, Benjamin, I want you to put my silver cup. And this was not just a small drinking goblet that he put in. It was, I understand, a large cup from which Joseph poured out wine to others. <laughs> so he put that one in Benjamin's so off they go down the road just um, feeling full of mixed emotions. They had found their brother and they had food and Benjamin's safe and all like that. And they gave him Simeon and so everything looks pretty rosy until here come the horsemen behind them. And they stop them just like a wild west show get off your camels or whatever they're riding donkeys we want to check your load here they hauled the sacks out they said you know joseph's divining cup is missing this silver cup of our master it's missing and we want to make sure to see if you've taken it with you and so they started from the eldest to the youngest and they found it in Benjamin's sack. But before they find it, while they're still looking, the other brothers are, they are really disturbed. And they said, well, I'm, we don't have it. We would never take it. And if you find any of us that have it, he will, he will die. And the rest of us will be your, your bond servants. You can take his life. And so when it came to Benjamin, they said, um, then they had to take them back to Joseph. Joseph wants to talk to you about that. And so, this is what the brothers had said, With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. Now that was really something. That was something for them. Their hearts are changing already. And so, when they get back to Joseph, Joseph vetoes that. He didn't want that. He said, The man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get up in peace unto your father. <laughs> Joseph saying, I want the one with the cup in his sack. <laughs> with that cup in his sack. And this cup, remember when the disciples came to Jesus and they said, um, we want to entreat the Lord that we could sit on either side of you in your glory. And he said, well, if you can drink my cup, you can sit there. And so that's the same with the cup in our sack. If you can drink that cup, the Lord keeps you. You can sit on his right hand as the son of his right hand. And we don't just take a few sips. He said, drink ye all of it. All of it. And our cups have come in different sizes and in different measures. But we have all been asked to drink that cup. And we didn't ask for this cup to be put in our sack. 
We didn't ask to go this way of the cross and to go through things that the average churchgoer never experiences. And while we're going through it, they're looking down on us and calling us Benoni, <laughs> son of my sorrow. <laughs> we didn't ask for this, but it was by divine appointment. Joseph did it. Our Jesus did it. And he knew exactly what he was doing. He put it in the sack of the remnant of the one who had come forth from Rachel. Not the ones that had come forth from the law. There's no, there's no cup in their sacks. It's in the sack of the one that was added unto Joseph. Joseph's name means added. And Benjamin was added unto Joseph. In other words, Joseph is Jesus. And we are that company that's being added unto Jesus. He is the head. We are the body. And the body grows up into the head to make one body. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we are that portion that is added unto him. He didn't add the whole body of Christ at once. He added first the remnant company because that's how he does it. He didn't want us to think by dint of numbers we could pull this off. No, no. He had a small number that he was going to put through the fire and bring forth. Hallelujah. And so he said, the man in whose hand the cup is found. You have to not only know that it's in your tent, in your sack, but you have to take it in your hand and say, yes, Lord, I will bear this cup. I will drink from it. I will pour out whatever you put in it. I will take the cup of the Lord and drink it. Hallelujah. And so Pharaoh said, Take your father and your households, and I'll give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat the fat of the land. But before they go, I want to remind you of something, and that is the whole issue of this story of the remnant has to do with what? Food, doesn't it? From beginning to end, food is the issue, because there's a famine in the land. And there's a, a lack of food. And so no food could be forthcoming until Benjamin came to where Joseph was, to where Jesus is. Remember that word I first uh, said to you at the beginning? The Lord spoke to the sister, Benjamin is coming. And there'll be no more food until he is released to come where the Father is. Hallelujah. So I want to digress just a little bit here to um, give you a scripture that is so potent. Benjamin, well, each of the tribes had a prophecy from their father Jacob when he died. And uh, because the remnant is so relevant to us, we need to look at the prophecy concerning us. What does he say about Benjamin when Jacob is dying? What did he say about us? He said, Benjamin shall raven a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. In the scriptures it says, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. But in the original, as is not there. It's been put in by the translators. It's not there. It says, Benjamin shall raven a wolf. It means to tear in pieces and feed. And who or what is this wolf? The wolf are the beastly, carnal teachings of man's system. And Benjamin is going to tear them to pieces and turn them into food. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. He'll tear them into pieces and turn them into food for the hungry. Hallelujah. Benjamin shall raven a wolf, tear and pace in pieces and feed those beastly carnal teachings of man's systems who tear them down. We heard Benjamin ravening this morning, didn't we? Whoa! <laughs> One brother said, before I came up here, the Lord told me, I want you to um, know my heart. He said, Lord, how can I know your heart? How do I, how do I learn about your heart? And as he sat this morning and Gary was ministering about 
God's true heart and his true nature, this brother said to me afterwards, I heard God's heart. I understood his nature like I had never seen it before. And so Gary Benjamin was up here doing that. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> Benjamin shall raven a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey. Now, what time are we in? We're coming into the morning of the new day. In the morning, we shall devour the prey, and at night, he shall divide the spoil. In the evening of this dispensation, at night, the evening of this dispensation, we will share it with those who have been in darkness, in nighttime, in ignorance, in lack of understanding. At night he shall divide the spoil. Well, we have abundance of spoil that the Lord has given us. And in the night, in the darkness in which we find ourselves, we are going to share it with those who are in that darkness. But we are in the morning, and we are devouring that which has been our prey, that which has preyed upon God's people to take away their peace, to take away their confidence in God. We're going to devour that thing. And in the midst of their darkness, we're going to give them light and set them free and divide the spoil with them. Here, I've gone up and I have got this spoil. I have these treasures to share with you. Hallelujah. I want to share that verse with you from John 4 and 34, where um, Jesus tells us what his meat is. We're talking about food here. And Jesus told us what his meat is. He said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. And that is our meat also. That's the meat of the remnant, to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> oh, Father. Oh, Father. And now we're going to find out what treasures Joseph sent with them. He, he was asking them to come down to Egypt and to dwell there with him in safety. They'll give them land and they'll provide food until the famine is over. And uh, the Pharaoh was certainly agreeing with this. He said, take your father and your households. I'll give you the best of the land of Egypt and you shall eat of the fat of the land. Now, before I tell you what he gave them, I want to discuss what it means as Joseph ruling over all Egypt. We say that lightly. Well, Joseph ruled over all Egypt. What does it mean? Egypt is that sense realm, that descender, where we descend into the sense realm. Hey, Jesus rules over all that realm. Our Joseph, our heavenly Joseph rules over all that sense realm. And he calls us as his Benjamin company to rule over that sense realm also. Hallelujah. To rule over that sense realm, that, that carnal nature, all those things that, that lead us away from that new creation man. And so that's why he had to wait for Benjamin to come. He said, Benjamin must come to where I am because he must also rule over Egypt. None of the other brothers <clears throat> ever ruled over all Egypt but Joseph because he had come through suffering unto glory. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. And so the gifts that he sent back with his family to Goshen, um, they're very significant. Very significant. And he said to all of them, he gave each man changes of raiment. Each of the brethren had a change of raiment. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. We keep running into this five all the time. The changes of raiment of grace. Oh, my. You know, I want just to digress here for a minute about these changes of raiment. Did you know that... We have different garments that we wear all the time, and we're maybe not aware of it. When we come into worship and we're before the Lord, we have on 
our holy garments of the high priest as we're ministering unto the Lord and understand this to be spiritual. And then when we're with the world or at the job, we don't wear that garment. They can't stand to see it because the Shekinah glory is upon it. We hang that in the closet until we get alone with Jesus. We wear another garment out to the world. I learned this a few years back. We were in this certain town. We have a dear friend there who belonged to this Benjamin company. And we called up to see if we could come over and have a little visit. Oh, she said, oh, I feel so bad. She said, yeah, some of my family, my sisters and their husbands and so on, are coming. And I'd love to ask you to come too, but they don't know anything about these things. So they'd want to talk natural things. And I would be dying to talk of spiritual things with you and Bill. And, and I couldn't, so I don't know what to do. I said, sister, don't give it a second thought. There's no problem. It looks like the Lord has told you to wear your garment of accommodation today for your family. And so we wouldn't come into your place with our holy garments on. When you have on your garments of accommodation, we will come another time. The Lord arranges these things, and they were coming before ever we came to town. We'll have another opportunity. She said that blessed her so much because she didn't feel, well, you know, uh, I've rejected my friends or this or that. I said, no, that's the garment that you are to wear today, that garment of accommodation to meet them wherever they are. We wear it all the time. And sometimes we think, Lord, I've had this all garment of accommodation on for so long. I want to get into those holy garments. I want to get into that praise and, and worship into your presence. And so we do wear these different garments. And it's all right to have on your garment of accommodation where they don't know who you are. And they can't see who you are. You're, um, you look just the same to them, except your countenance is brighter and your eyes are shining and you've got a smile on your face. There's a lot of differences that way. But you don't really expose yourself to them. And so Benjamin was given five changes of raiment. So I think he had an abundance of ability to help people wherever they were, to meet them at the lowest or at the highest plane. He was able to do that. And he wants us to do that too. We won't ever think we're so high that we can't condescend to someone of low estate or to a child or to an immature one. We'll just put on our garment of accommodation. And if we have opportunity to be with the priest, fine. We'll all have on our priestly garments and have a wonderful time. <laughs> it's okay. Because Benjamin had lots of garments. We can be all things to all men, whatever it needs to reach them, right? Okay. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so to all of them, they gave each man, the men of the law, have a change of raiment. Yes. But Benjamin has five. <laughs> he can change from grace to grace to grace to grace. <laughs> Glory to God. And he also gave him, remember the five messes? And he also gave him 300 pieces of silver. Now, 300 is very significant in the scriptures. 300 equals perfect wholeness. You like that, Benjamin? Perfect wholeness Jesus gave to us. Of a sound mind. Of a sound loving heart. This was a gift from Joseph to the son of his right hand. Perfect wholeness. And you remember the alabaster box? that Mary had brought and Judas rebuked her because what's the meaning of this waste you know it costs so much and here you are pouring it all over his head she said I've done it to anoint him for burial and you know the value of that alabaster box was 300 I don't know 300 what whatever they called their money but it was 300 denarii or whatever it was the price of perfect wholeness that she paid to anoint her Lord. Hallelujah. There's another 300 in Noah's Ark because the dimensions of the Ark were 300 by 50 by 30. And that means complete deliverance for the mature. 
the 30 is the mature part. Remember, Jesus could not minister as a priest until he was 30. That's the time of maturity. That's the age when the, they could be a priest, when they're 30. That's the time of maturity. And so he gave to his Benjamin company 300 pieces of silver, complete deliverance for the mature. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Listen to it. <laughs> complete deliverance for the mature. Oh, yes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And there's another very significant 300 found um, with King Solomon. He had 300 shields, which is complete deliverance from war. Do you like that? Complete deliverance from the war that rages within us. Flesh versus spirit. Spirit against the flesh. Carnal mind against the spiritual mind. Complete deliverance from war. And remember when the children of Israel were to um, go in the second generation to go in and possess the land? Uh, Joshua said that they had to remain 40 years in the wilderness until, did it say until all the older generation were dead? I used to think it said that. It doesn't say that. It says until all the men of war have died. Have you been a man of war? Hey, have you been a man of war? If so, he's going to slay that man of war. You'll not enter in taking that man of war with you. You'd have to stay in the wilderness until the man of war will die. 